Today I had the opportunity to speak with Niels Heusingfeld, who is the owner and founder of Heusingfeld Engineering. They were one of the first companies to offer a high-end sim racing pedal and have used that markedly to become the standard for high-end sim racing pedals. I'm excited to share this conversation about Neil's modest beginnings as we talk about how he got started, entrepreneurship, physics, and of course the sim racing hardware market. So yeah, tell me about how you got started in sim racing and your background is in engineering. Is that right? Yeah, I've uh, got a bachelor's degree for what it's worth in mechanical engineering, uh, mainly because I always like to play with Technic Lego, with the gears and, and, and making cars and stuff like that. So when you're like, when you have to make a decision, what sort of a career you're going towards, you don't really know when you're a young kid, but I like Technic Lego. So I went that way. And sim racing is uh, as old as as the genre, really, because I'm I'm 40 years old now. I'm not really ashamed to admit that. That's just uh, how it goes. So I've been there since since the old days when it was DOS and 2D, and we were lucky to get 15 frames per second. So I've witnessed it. Be, you know, you needed a lot of imagination then to call it a sim, and I witnessed it all like mature into what we have uh, these days. So it's always been with me and, and the hardware a little bit as well. As a kid, I had very little skills. I mean, I've been on your uh, your uh, YouTube channel and saw how you make your wheels and stuff. It's really like you do everything yourself. Like hats off to that for that. It's really a lot of skills to uh, to, to have and to learn. So imagine the, 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 the total inverse of that uh, in, on my side, especially when I was younger. But I always tried to... to make it better because we only had keyboard steering then and I was trying to figure out ways how to make things from Technic Lego that would press buttons on the keyboard. None of it ever worked, but my mind was in there already. So it, it's been with me like that for 30 years. Um, I think the first sort of thing we actually did, I actually did was in uh, 2005 or six, we made a pedal set. When I say we, a couple of friends here locally, also sim racers. So I made a really simple design and there's this great thing here in town. Actually, I don't live in the town anymore, but it's, it's still nearby where you can sort of rent a workshop uh, for it's like 20 bucks a day or something. It's really no nothing uh, expensive and you get like a saw and, and a drill uh, machines and everything. So if your design is simple enough, you can go there and make it. And we spend a day there with uh, the friends uh, making a simple pedal set with a load cell. It's always been on the back of my mind, and that's important to stress because when we really started in 2013, so it's about six years ago, it's not like it all started in 2012 and we, I had a rough idea and I met Sven, another one of those sim racing friends who lived locally. It's not like it came out of the blue. We were sort of sim racing and I was thinking about it uh, for 20 odd years and it just sort of evolved into uh, how it how it started. Yeah, that's one thing that I find, especially with starting a business, because I'm really similar, where, <clears throat> where it's not like, especially for a business like yours that's successful, and in, in, I mean, you've really cut a corner in the whole sim racing world, but it's not like you did a market research and you thought this was a good business plan, and you know you thought you'd have your idea and then you could develop it and start it. It's like you you do this for fun, and you tried to then make it work as a business plan, but first you really, you love doing it first. Absolutely, yeah. And that's just a benefit that I don't think you can get at if you're like uh, just a businessman who looks for, for ways to make money. Perhaps, I don't know, powdered milk is, is the, whole, the hot thing and you can make money there, but I don't feel any passion for, for powdered milk. If, if it's something is your your hobby, your passion, and has been like that for, for many years, if you do manage to make a product out of it, it's likely that people will see and feel that uh, there's a level of passion and, and engineering that goes into it and understanding the hobby, because I've been doing it for so long, yeah, that, that really helps. Right. So then when you decided that you wanted to make your own, you said back in 2012, you were kind of thought, hey, I could turn this into a business? 
Yeah, that's where uh, where Sven comes in, my business partner. So we've been friends, not like seeing each other weekly, but every year, a couple of times uh, on birthday parties and stuff like that. And I was working on a design in uh, 2012 just for myself because the pedal set I just mentioned, we built it in 2005 or six. The load cell was 50 kilos and I wanted to have a bit more of a workout. So I started designing and the reason... Uh, could do this is I have a very inexpensive lifestyle. Uh, it's not something that it's like I, I try to do it. I just don't really care about brand name clothes or a nice car. I just don't, mm-hmm. and I go. I don't really go on holidays further than like an hour's drive away from home. So, just my natural way of living is is to live fairly inexpensively. So at some point I had some money, which is the most powerful thing you can have is money because you can decide what to do and you don't rely on banks or uh, stuff like that to, to, to start. And you cannot start big, but you can at least uh, start with it. So I had a design in 2012 and I was kind of thinking about possibly, you know, putting it uh, on a web shop somewhere. And that's where uh, Sven came in and he said, well, I mean, Sven has more sort of a, a business background and still a passionate sim racer, but sort of some, some sort of the, the guy who goes, okay, hang on, uh, how can we do this properly? Uh, and what sort of direction might we have to take? So it's very in, yeah, very important combination because I'm just the engineer and I wouldn't really care too much about the business side of it, to be honest. So he, he saw the prototypes and he said, well, I think this, uh, this might work. And if you assemble a couple of sets and I make a web shop, we might sell a few and perhaps we can that's what i always say we can take the wives out to dinner once or twice a year and it'll be good fun (laughs) yep and that's how it sort of started so uh everything was financed from my uh let's say uh, lack of style lifestyle just everything is was was cheap and and simple so i had some money to begin with and Mm -hmm. then we decided on a price that seemed too high at the time but we also figured well the profit margin might seem very high now, but suppose it does take off and you have to hire a guy, you have to rent a place, you need insurance. And those things add up so quickly that we thought, well, we we pick a price that has a healthy profit so that we can slowly grow. So these batches mm-hmm. uh, started to grow because we had the money that came in meant we could order double the, the batch or, or one and a half times the batch. And that's sort of a line that just sort of kept going uh, since then right yeah and that's that is so smart that's something that i um try to learn and practice myself the i mean even going back to living below your means i think that is like i think that is the single biggest uh lifestyle like decision that people should make that they mess up on because you really shouldn't be wasting your money on things that you don't need and and uh and it even goes back to like doing what you love. Like I would so much rather make, you know, say 60,000, 60,000 a year doing something I absolutely love than 600,000 a year doing something I hate. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, 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 uh, it's just, and so then you, you guys, you bootstrap the whole thing. So you really didn't use much or any financing. And then you did a 50, 50 partnership. Yeah. Yeah. At some point, uh, at first we were just like, uh, a one-man op- operation and Sven well his idea was to do it like uh, half a day a week and he would just uh, send me an invoice as a consultant and I would pay him for that but once it started to take off I think it's it was one week before his first uh, baby was born he quit his daytime job uh, mm-hmm. to go full-time with me and now we're 50 50 it's uh, it the, you, there is another example I, I forgot who it was but I think it's a uh, the, a book called Freakonomics, Super Freakonomics. It's a series of books. It's it's sort of funny and interesting, where it's written by an economics guy and uh, a writer, and they were discussing the how to split the money for the book. And one said, "Well, I, I think it should be sixty forty," and the other said, the "Guy said, oh, well, I can't do that. No, no, no. I mean sixty for you." <laughs> it's it's very hard mm-hmm. it's very hard to determine who's more who's who's more important than the other because without the business side we wouldn't be where we are 
without the engineering side, we would also not be where we are. So we just, yeah, went uh, 50, 50 on that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's, that's really great. And, and I had even gotten advice, um, from like a family friend who has, a, I mean, it's probably 10 to $15 million business. And I kind of asked him, I said, well, look, I'm a one man show. Um, does it make sense? Cause I had had people ask about if I'd be interested in investors. And I was like, does it make sense to take on an investor and, um, and, you know, start to scale a bit. And, and he really recommended not to, um, because first off, when you're coming like a partnership, you have to make sure that they're a really good partner. And like Sven, I mean, sounds like an awesome partner, but, uh, but also like scaling, you don't, you want you don't want to scale too fast. I think that's like a big, big thing for me. And what's worked for you is like, it's that slow and steady growth that, then pays off in the end, I feel, versus trying to, you know, have an idea and then do a huge batch and then, you know, do it at scale right away. Yeah, that just never felt comfortable. Uh, plus, if if you go the hard way, make a business plan, go to the bank or find investors, you are sort of obliged to make it a, a success. And when you start, you don't really know what's going to happen. So that felt super uncomfortable, this, just the idea. And... You know, sometimes people start a business and uh, they they are stuck in the logo and website stage and they spend a lot of money on marketing and on sort of a hip and trendy look and feel to the place. And we just, I, I spent 10 minutes in Microsoft Word with uh, our first logo and I think we spent 400 bucks on the website, including the, the shop because a friend of ours mm-hmm. made it. So we really went low budget there and it served us for, for multiple years and just not doing it sort of like uh, nothing flash and just focusing on the product. And if it's good and you get like the iRacing forums or other places, they start to recommend it. I mean, that's all the marketing you really need. And to this day, we don't do a lot of marketing. Uh, We're only just sort of slowly picking it up uh, with uh, sort of a video guy who comes uh, in our place one day a week-ish. But it's not like... It's never been the backbone. And, and I think if you rely on the marketing, there's something wrong with your products. If they should be good enough, so they sell themselves really, which is so far, thankfully, uh, the case. You're right. I mean, it's like you look at Tesla. Um, I mean, I'm a huge Tesla fan. I talk about them all the time, but yeah, they're the same way. I mean, word of mouth marketing is going to be, it's so much more valuable. And if you can create an immense amount of value for your customer, then they will talk about it. And you know, it's kind of a, it's a positive feedback loop. Yeah. Yeah. Although Tesla, I don't think they've made a single dime yet, have they, since they started, but that's a sore point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're a little bit, a little bit of a different story, but, but I do think they are uh, an awesome company. I'm a big Elon fan. So um, now that you're, now that you're, I mean, uh, a well-established business, what's your day-to-day like? How many employees do you have? Uh, that changes, I wouldn't say daily, because that's a, a very big lie, but it's it's grown to the point uh, where initially uh, we were just the two of us. I did the assembly, some engineering, and Sven did the support and the shipping and that sort of stuff. But when you're a one-man sort of engineer guy, and I'm pretty sure you must feel uh, mostly the same, that there's only so much time in the week, and I've never been a workaholic. Um I can spend 60 or 70 hours at something, but I will only work effectively half of that. So Mm -hmm. pretty soon I run out of time and doing the assembly yourself means you're not spending the time doing what you're probably more unique and more skilled in is is thinking of new designs. So we came to the point where we could hire a guy for assembly and this sort of kept going. So first then the assembly was taken out of my hands and then I could just focus on uh, design. But... The batches got bigger and bigger, so you have to do all the, the purchasing and chasing uh, suppliers around and that sort of stuff. So that becomes quite involved once the batches go uh, up in size. And that went on for a while, and then we figured, well, it's a big investment, but why don't we hire uh, another guy to do all the uh, like the coordination of all the assembly work and do all the purchasing. So gradually over the years, I've been played free from all the non-engineering jobs, more or less. And it's I, I'm not really a good uh, sort of 
I, my, my time spent is very inefficient. I'll, I'll gladly admit that. So I think I work, perhaps it's, uh, it's, it's 40 hours a week actively at most, uh, because design is so weird. Uh, I can sit down and nothing happens and some, some, mm-hmm. some weeks pass and then I have a reasonable idea. And in two weeks we have a prototype. It's very hard mm-hmm. to, uh, to control that. And it's also great that we have our own company and I can be like this because if I would work for an employer, I don't know how, how well that would go. Uh, I might do something reasonably good one day and then nothing for the rest of the week. <laughs> right. So I can be myself here and I, you know, I need a bit of time for other hobbies and, and time to just do nothing. And it's, it's never nothing, you know, it's always in the back of your mind and you sometimes you wake up with an idea. So it, it's definitely a full-time thing, but just the sitting down behind the computer doesn't really mean that much. But what, yeah, I really I agree. But the days that I do uh, attempt to work, or try to work, or pretend to work, it's it's a bit of everything. So I, I'm at the office a couple of days a week, but I also work from home a couple of days because it's it's quiet and peaceful, and I can focus more. And a lot of it is uh, prototypes of of coming products, and my mind just goes left and right and, and back and forth on all sorts of things that we would like to do. So it's. Uh, 50% just sketching, uh, even on, on paper or in, uh, in 2D CAD. I'm, I'm mostly 2D, it's just old school, I think. But when you laser cut sheet metal, 2D is mostly the enough. So it's really old fashioned mm-hmm. and just sketching and sketching. And then something seems good. And then a month later, you might look at it again and you think, hey, this is weird. Why did I do it that way? Perhaps it's more efficient to do it the other way. So it's sort of a, a very big sketchbook that slowly progresses for, for each product. And then at some point we make a prototype. So it's a bit of, uh, of that. And then we have uh, testing machines in place, like pneumatic actuators that sort of continuously pull on a handbrake, for example. And you can check how that goes. But it's, it's mostly just uh, trying to, uh, to come up with ideas and just sketching. And at some point it will sort of iterate towards uh, something good enough to try in a prototype. And that's, that's mainly the, the job. And, um, like I said, the day-to-day business stuff is mostly done by people far more skilled at, at, uh, at that than I am. So I keep an eye out and sometimes we get like a, some, a small issue from a batch of uh, production. We have to make a decision. Do we have to send it back or can we fix it? So it's a bit, I think 25% is the day-to-day stuff and 75% is trying to think of uh, new products. Mm-hmm. Yeah, especially I, I totally agree, especially on the creative end, like it's hard to just sit down and say, OK, I'm going to sit down for the next six hours and be creative. It's like you can't you, you can't really push it, um, you know, and sometimes it's nice to, you know, think about something maybe throughout the day or throughout the week. And then, you know, you're, you're watching a video or you're looking at an Instagram post or and it, and it kind of like strikes you. And, and that's, that's the time where I've kind of found like, okay, that's where I need to write it down or, um, you know, start working on it because it's kind of like an inspiration and, uh, or even sometimes sleep on it. Like you say, like I'll sometimes I'll be trying to go to bed and I'll, something will just pop in my head and I'll have to quick type it on my phone as, you know, in a notepad to, <laughs> to uh, remember. So. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I just read the book, uh, the sort of autobiography of a uh, uh, designer. Uh, what's his name again? Uh, John Barnard. So that, that mm. some of my brain was uh, fading me. Famous uh, race car mm. designer. And the, the, he says the greatest tip he ever got from his uh, boss was just to leave it for the weekend. It'll sort itself out. And most of the time, uh, that, that's true indeed. But I find it, right. it's more sort of trying to uh, create the conditions that allow your brain to sort of work. And like I said, I have quite a peculiar brain. It might sometimes come up with a product and, well, there's evidence that they are okay. Uh, so that's, that's nice, but it doesn't do it by itself. So I have to try and create the conditions. And that means not working too many hours, not trying to force it for some reason, just you know, take a couple of days off, go for a walk, uh, read another book. I don't, you know, don't, don't work on it all the time consciously because it will, mm. 
it will come hopefully and and you cannot force it if you try to force it it's like you have like eye caps on and you're you're thinking too narrow minded and it's just weird how how hours don't really work at all and it's just the conditions have to be created where somehow every now and then something happens right yeah i totally agree so i mean it sounds like you're a reader like myself um i mean what kind of books have really helped shape your uh idea on like how you run your business i know for me um i would say like one of the biggest would be company of one and the lean startup um but yeah what about for you uh well that's probably a, a sort of a, the wrong impression i gave i don't really read that many books all right uh, <laughs> So it's just that, that I got this one recently and like the free economics one is uh, are fun. I probably only read like a, a couple dozen books in, in, in total in my life and rarely read them for like inspiration or with the aim of getting something out of them other than just entertainment or it's interesting. So I got a couple of history right. books the other, other day because I just didn't know anything about like the second and first world war. And there's this book by a Dutch historian who I kind of like with a sense of humor. So it's interesting to read about that, but it's, that's clearly not related to anything uh, I do uh, during the day or things like right. the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy, which I just reread, you know, that's uh, it doesn't go as deep and it's not really for the purpose of trying to, to learn something from, at least not directly. Right. I've actually heard about that and I've heard a lot of good things. I'll have to try that sometime. I do actually a lot of uh, audible audio books. Mm. I like doing that. So, cause what I, I used to work at a machine shop and so I could wear um, like earmuffs yeah. um, and then have a Bluetooth earbud and I would just listen to audio books. <laughs> so, so. Yeah, it's a great way to learn on the job. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It helped, you know, I had a 10 hour shift. So, and it was a night shift. So it's like, what else am I going to do? Yeah, but uh, but yeah. So I mean, talking now the sim market. I'd like to kind of get your perspective on that because it's it's expanding. I mean, everyone keeps talking about that, and it and it's pretty apparent. But I mean, what what do you see the potential growth? Do you think that's going to keep going? And then it was silent. I really I really don't know. It's weird when we started. Uh, we just never imagined this to ever become what it has become so apparently there are lots of sim races out there but it's very hard to uh to to get a feel for this for this market and where where is the end does it ever end because like i said we just keep on growing and we're still often sold out and people complain that we uh, should build them quicker which if only it was as easy as it sounds uh, right so absolutely no idea uh, where it where it will end it's it's definitely growing uh, i just took my car in for a service today and so the guy asked oh what's your name yeah husingfeld hey are you the pedal guy so <laughs> it's it's some, somehow is more widespread than than sim racing than it was it's more accessible perhaps and guys like because uh, this uh, mechanic guy knew jimmy broadband the, from from his streams and that's what made him go get a, a wheel so People like that and YouTube, it's, it's sort of people who didn't know about sim racing can sort of figure out what it is now and, and, and see that it's a pretty cool community and with cool stuff available. So I, I have no idea where it ends. Uh, also important with the business is we don't try to go into a, like a direction where it's very hard to go back. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to, uh, we always think, okay, let's say it drops by 50%. Uh, can we still make something sustainable? And we always try to make it scalable because we just don't know what's going to happen. Right. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I mean, especially on the lead time, it seems like just about everybody has a lead time right now, you know, unless you're one of the big names. And so it, it's a good sign to have. But um, yeah, you can definitely tell that the demand is at least it's there for sure. And I think I think a lot of times, especially with customers that I've been having coming in and I'll talk to, um, a lot of time is it'll be people that have done stuff on the track before and, you know, they may have the means to do it, but they now that the hardware and the software is so good, there's the value of, you know, spending 10000 on a racing rig is is outweighs, 
spending the time and money on a real car going on the real track. Yeah, it's it's pretty hard to convince some sim racers that it's a really cheap hobby, but it's very easy to to convince uh, a real driver that it's uh, just pocket money. Really, it's it's really uh, the value is is amazing. Uh, despite if you want to get the good stuff like our pedals, your wheel, direct drive, it's not cheap, but it's available twenty four hours a day, and it's just a fraction of the cost of uh, of real driving. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. And. I mean, because one spin in a real car and you can be looking at tens of thousands and a huge headache, you know, plus or minus, you know, medical bills and you do it in the sim and you kind of just get reset. Yeah. Have you ever done some real uh, driving or? I haven't. And that's that's something that I, I would love to do someday. Um, you know, we have, I'm in Minnesota. So really the only thing around me is dirt ovals, um, kind of small small stuff there's really no circuits around and i guess a couple hours away from me there there's a little it's kind of a small track that is paved and it's it's um but yeah i'd like to i'd like to do something even if it's like a skip barber or something it'd be fun to fun to do that how about you yeah it's it's something i did last year uh and i will do it again in a couple of weeks so there it but that's also where the costs start to start to add up. It's a business expense nowadays, so that uh, helps a little bit with taxes. <laughs> and that's not right. even a joke. It's actually true and relevant. So it's, uh, yeah, but it was like a BMW uh, 325i uh, with uh, roll cage and stuff like that, but quite rusty and old. And it still costs 1,700 uh, euros for uh, three days. At uh, Assen, the MotoGP track here very close to me, was really interesting uh, also a bit sketchy with the material uh, and it doesn't really run very economical when you floor it all the time so lots of petrol uh, to put in and lots uh, the gas bill was substantial but it mm. was interesting uh, to do and in a couple of weeks i'll do it again uh, but this time they've prepared some better cars so i think this one is 3700 euros for the week for for three days or two days even three days so it's really that adds up like that's a direct drive uh, system with a, your wheel and our pedals just for two days of driving a reasonable dri uh, racing car on the track. So it really adds right. up. But I hope this time I, I can actually get a bit more comfortable with it. And since it's better prepared, uh, be a bit more like towards going towards the limit. Last time it was very different conditions. Every minute raining, dry, windy, cold. So the grip levels were never the same. The car was a bit sketchy, but I hope to uh, to get more to the limit ish uh, in a couple of weeks. But just just doing it for a couple of days is already like more than I've ever spent on anything personally. So it's, it's it gets out of hand real quick. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So then, would would you ever do? Because um, I've also heard some of the funnest like club racing is just like the Miata. I don't know if they have a whole lot of that over in Europe or not, but. Yeah, they do. But, uh, yeah, a friend of ours actually uh, won the the sort of the NA, the the first gen Miata Cup, a couple of years ago, and that's I think the cheapest way to to race. And he's in the sort of the, the grown up Miata Cup now with the newer cars. It's a lot more expensive, mm -hmm. and in fact, the the field is a lot smaller, and it's all they take it a bit too seriously sometimes. So perhaps I wonder if he had more fun uh, and spent like. A, a quarter the money uh, a couple of years ago that that's possible but racing itself doesn't really interest me that much at least not now i like to get a feel for the car and see if i can get somewhere to a limit but racing against others is not something that i well do you trust them you know it's a bit, it's a little bit online yeah. and you i don't really care but like you say a, a dent or a crash can be expensive and possibly painful and i don't really feel the need to go uh free wide into a corner against people I don't know. <laughs> so I, I, I like the idea of just figuring out like, how does this feel? And especially since I also do physics model, modeling in, in, in Automobilista, can I recreate this or what, what am I feeling and how should it feel in the sim and, and stuff like that. But you cannot really say much about that with just a few hours in a partly uh, bent and crooked car. So it's, it's pretty tough, but I would hopefully, if, if I enjoy it in a couple of weeks, perhaps every now and then, see if I can get a slightly better car and do some uh, track days. But yeah, we'll see. Yeah. So do you think you can bring some of that, 
like experience beyond the track do you think that will help translate over to your daily work uh, it's hard to tell uh it for, for one it would be very difficult for for us to make a brake pedal that is as terrible as the one in uh, in the bmw was <laughs> i just wouldn't know how to do it um uh-huh so and, and the steering was terrible too it was like a broken g25 so if <laughs> if anything it all pointed towards our sim equipment being way superior to entry level track day uh, stuff uh yeah that's probably a good point but it's actually interesting because that's one of the things in the physics as well in in, in most sims things are a bit too perfect perhaps uh, especially in uh regard to how how solid the car is built how straight it is uh, that's interesting and if I would do future physics modeling work, it would be interesting to see, okay, what makes these cheap track day cars so terrible? And perhaps the brake system should be more complicated in the physics as well to allow for this this, this vagueness and uh, make it more realistic and less perfect. Right. Yeah, so that's another thing I was going to ask about is, so being a developer uh, with Automobilista, on the physics end, how does that, I mean, it's got to be extremely hard to translate the physics of what is in a real car to the sim. I mean, and so what's that like? Uh, it's it's, it's kind of easy uh, with a big disclaimer, of course, because I, I started physics modeling for R-Factor, the first R-Factor game that came out in 2006. I started doing that in 2007, and I'm still doing it for Automobilista, which is uh, like R Factor 1.5 when it comes to physics. So after 10 plus years, uh, things that seem easy didn't seem easy when I started. But there isn't a lot of magic involved. I really try to uh, be objective as much as possible and just put in numbers that are believable and hopefully real and sometimes you've got telemetry from the real car so you know it's cornering speeds around a certain track the g-forces and sometimes even the suspension travel and stuff like that so it's not nothing more in a sense than just putting in the numbers but knowing what sort of numbers to put in is just a gradual evolution over 10 years of doing it so it seems simple to i wouldn't say simple but somewhat straightforward to me now but 10 years ago i didn't even know how downforce worked and why or if ride heights would be important for for downforce or you know what suspension geometry was like and what the properties of a mcpherson strut versus a double wishbone suspension would be it all came super slowly and gradually uh, thanks to lots of like the online community and, and people i uh, that know a lot more than me being uh, willing to spend some time with me on that so it's 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 a bit like yeah if once you're reasonably good at something it seems easy and to me uh making a car if you say okay Niels, we need a formula free car here's the data you can have a pretty solid sim model in in a couple of days now and that's sounds weird but it's 10 years plus a couple of days always have to keep that in mind but it's fairly straightforward right. there is no magic in, involved and you have to sort of translate uh the data and uh the numbers you most of them you can put in and if you know the physics engine really well which over 10 years you kind of you know you get intimate with it you, you kind of know what to do uh there's always subjectivity of course but it's not like starting from scratch uh, all the time you kind of know what sort of car it is and You've done a similar car before, so you have a rough idea of which direction to go there. So in, in a way, it's not as complicated as it sounds. But then if I'd show you the spreadsheets and everything, I don't think you would fully understand it because it takes uh, a lot of time to, to to work that out, of course. Right. So, yeah, because I, I come, I mean, I did like a, a, a Python class in uh, my first year of college, and I, I realized very quickly that I needed to drop out of it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm not I'm not a, like a software guy at all, and so just kind of a background or baseline knowledge. So the physics engine that is the engine that has all of the physics equations, and then in the game you just sort of model and then uh, use that engine and then make tweaks. Or how's that how does that even work? I don't even. Yeah, that's a good, good question. Um, with R-Factor, I mean, you're probably familiar with R-Factor 2. I don't know if you've been around long enough to play the first R-Factor. 
Um, I mean, I have not actually. I only did two. Yeah, so it, it was it was open in the sense that it 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 was sort of supportive of modding, so people could make their own three uh, D models and sounds and physics stuff for it. But the engine, which kind of indeed means the equations that calculate everything as you're driving, they were sort of fixed. But the numbers that go into all these equations were up to you. So you could create a torquer for an engine. Uh, give the tires a certain amount of grip, uh, set the gear ratios, and a million other things. So initially, it was mainly just uh, trying to figure out what all these numbers did because it wasn't so open that they told you exactly what the formulas were. You had to kind of figure it out, and they were a bit cryptic with some descriptions, but it was quite tricky. So we sort of reverse engineered it a bit with uh, spreadsheet tools and stuff like that, but only the numbers that you see if you open one of those physics files in Notepad, you see a whole bunch of numbers that initially don't seem to make a lot of sense. Those are the ones we could uh, change. And then with Automobilista, since we had like the source code, we could actually add stuff to it. And I'm not very good at that at all. I'm not a programmer, but we added things like a turbo model, which was missing in the original uh, physics, which is a very simple model that I made in a spreadsheet and our programmer guy managed to turn it into actual code that runs in, in, in the game now. So it's, it's two things. It's a physics engine, all the equations and all the stuff that it needs and it calculates real time. Amazingly, it does that like 720 times per second. It's unimaginable how it can be done on a modern computer and it's only like 5% of your CPU. It's amazing. Hmm. And then it's the numbers that go into it. And that's that's my specialty, so uh, to speak. Hmm. And so then over time, like you said, you can adjust those numbers to um, sort of be level with how it should be in real life. Yeah, yeah, you kind of do. Now, some things make a lot of sense. One parameter will be the weight of the car. And that's something you probably, you can figure that out or you can look it up online. Uh, weight distribution is a number, for example. So a lot of the things like horsepower, uh, that sort of stuff, you'll be pretty good with just by looking up data and putting it in. But things like aerodynamics, if you have a downforce car, if you're lucky uh, and you work with a racing team uh, and it's a Formula 3 car, you can get like a spreadsheet from Dallara who make the car and you can see the number of uh, the, the downforce the car generates. And you can also see how it changes if the ride heights change, which is very critical in, in, in high downforce racing cars. And since we reverse engineered how the aerodynamics are calculated in the physics engine with all the formulas, you can sort of make an overlay of the real data with what the sim is currently calculating. So you can sort of make it quite close based on if you get a lot of data from the manufacturer and you know how your game engine works, you can sort of make it a one-on-one -on -one copy almost. Hmm. And so I suppose that's probably how like, I mean, iRacing is what I use most. Uh, and when they get a new car, they probably get all of that information from the manufacturer. And then it's a lot easier to make that model. It's hard to, hard to be sure. Uh, there are a couple of issues. A lot of the time, the manufacturers are so secretive that you simply don't get everything. So you need like a major uh, smooth operator talker guy to, uh, to massage all the numbers from uh, the de various departments at like Porsche or, some, uh, or Audi or stuff. They're not really forthcoming. And sometimes uh, things will simply be missing or unavailable. Uh, but I'm sure iRacing does their absolute best to get as much data as they can. But there's always some areas where you don't get the data, like the tires. You might get some some data, but tire data is a whole sort of different ball game. With uh, how can you use it? How can you trust it? Where can you not trust it? It's very complicated. So there is still a room for like subjective inter interpretation there. You know the grip levels because you know the lap times and uh, the, the g forces, but there's still a lot of stuff in the tire that you don't know and you have to sort of figure out. And so, yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised if iRacing gets a lot of data, but I also wouldn't be surprised that there are a few cars where they simply had to use their, well, they have engineers. You know, I mean, they have, they don't guess. It's very educated guess, but still mm -hmm. some, some parts are just not known. And like the tire model, that's been a big 
like place of contention for a long time. Like I remember for a while, for years, they would call it ice racing. Uh, what what goes into like a tire model like that? Oh, uh, that's in, in the case of eye racing. It's uh, a lot of magic and woo 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 that goes in. Uh, Dave <laughs> Dave Kemmer is the programmer, the main programmer, I think, at iRacing racing still, uh, and he's been doing racing sims since 1989. So he's really been there for a very long time, mm-hmm. and he went down a certain path with with eye racing, uh, making a really complicated advanced but also very complicated tire model and it's an interesting sort of tangent here with with sim racing you see it with r factor 2 for example as well it's it decided well we had r factor 1 worked well now we're going to make a more complicated advanced physical tire model and the downside of that is it's so complicated it might be more sort of a phd project for a super bright engineer and perhaps not as practical in a sim where you have like 35 different cars that you have to model and keep up to date. So the, what goes on into the tire model in iRacing is probably very complicated and, and, and difficult. Plus there has been seven models now, I think. Yet mm-hmm. if you look at R Factor 2, they also have a physical tire model, which is sort of a, a one way to do it, more sort of very complicated and theoretically really advanced, but also very complicated yet they feel completely different. So they probably set out with the same goal, like super realistic sim, yet the same car in the sim will feel absolutely different. That just means that, yeah, you can make a really complicated tire model, but I'm sort of more uh, a firm believer in let's keep it a bit simpler. And simple is really relative. Uh, Sometimes when I say, yeah, it's simple, I mean, I could show you the like the spreadsheets and the, and the formulas. It's it's certainly not simple, simple, but compared to iRacing racing and R Factor Two, simple within quotations. And that makes it relatively easy to work with. And with Sims having so much car, so many cars, and also iRacing racing has been going for ten years now, you have to keep your content up to date. So I think there's really an optimum where a tire model is too complicated for the practical application that you just want 35 cars to be consistent and nice to drive rather than having 35 experiments in super complicated PhD Einstein type uh, physics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's something that I think is true for the hardware and the software is like simplicity is, is kind of the the path that you want to take and I'll, I'll just go back around to like what Elon talks about with SpaceX when he was talking about in his most recent, uh, you know, uh, launch of the Starship or whatever. He was saying that his his uh, his most productive and best conversations with his engineers is what what were you able to de-engineer and delete to make it more simple in, in a way? Or, you know, what what were you able to remove from our, you know, from our product versus try to engineer a new part. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a lot of the time people underestimate or get a bit over optimistic when they start something. Oh, we have these features and those features and we do this and we do that. Kind of forgetting that at the end of the day, it has to be done within a certain budget, within a certain time frame, And it has to be, you know, if it's really good, it's better than and actually finished on time and within budget, it's way better than it being slightly better but two years late and a million over budget Mm -hmm. yeah i think that's that's also why like your design is uh is so awesome because it it is very straightforward and uh and yeah that's what that's what uh i think i think that's kind of just a good philosophy in general but uh so then as far as so then you've got the you've got like the, the tire model the physics model and everything so then for setups, what's your opinion on, uh, like, do you have a lot of experience with, like, setups and going faster and things like that? Well, um, it's, it's, it's sort of an interesting topic because I look at things from a vehicle dynamics sort of point of view. And when you, know, you read books about going faster and the Skip Barber book that I, I got for my birthday a couple of years ago, the language there and the setup guides online, they sort of confuse me uh, quite a bit. So I don't do that many that much setup work in the sense that 
I feel sometimes, uh, well, how do I put it? It's not really where you should be doing the work. A lot of the time, if you're four seconds off the pace, it doesn't make that much difference if you add two clicks of, of damper or, or stuff like that. And it, it could be an interesting topic. And I've sort of toyed with the idea of making like a video series about car setup from the vehicle dynamics perspective rather than uh, my car has this issue and then this is the magic fix by adding two clicks of this or that. That always makes me sort of confused when I look at those car setup guides. And one of the things we have in Automobilista are uh, go-karts, which are very strange little things, of course. And I was looking at the setup guides you can find online from the different manufacturers. And I found like completely contradicting info in one of them or two, uh, two of them. So he said, oh, you have understeer, make that more. And then the other guy would say, uh, make it less because there is no, right. it's sort of uh, people go by the seat of their pants and they tweak things in practice, but they don't always know what actually happens in the, in the vehicle dynamics, what the tire loads become or that sort of stuff. So it's, it's very important. Uh, but I typically just work on, on the main things like the, the ride heights is, are super important when you have a lot of downforce and there is a lot to do with uh, not so, so much the suspension geometry, but more the front to rear stiffness, the roll stiffness front and rear, that sort of stuff, the major stuff that really plays a big role. But sometimes I feel people are sort of uh, overtaking themselves a bit when it comes to car setup and, and thinking how it works. and it's very easy to read something online and sort of, well, nobody understands everything. So I understand that people read a setup guide and think, okay, so out does this, I'm going to apply that. But it's also very uh, easy to become victim to like placebo and feel things mm -hmm. that perhaps might not be there. And uh, since I do know a little bit, I wouldn't say I'm like, I'm not excellent at it or anything, but I know a little bit about vehicle dynamics and that makes these setup things really confusing a lot of the time. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. Especially, it, it, I, I definitely, like, uh, I see the kind of discrepancy between, uh, you know, trying to, I guess, looking at it at the placebo effect of, you know, trying to uh, view a setup guide and say, like, okay, a little more rake is going to give me, you know, more oversteer, and that's going to help me turn in here. And, uh, but then kind of from your point, it's like, well, you know, maybe the physics say a different thing. And uh, and it's kind of like this, the black magic, I guess. Because then if you talk to like the super aliens, you know, they don't really think about the physics at all. You know, they just say, oh, I don't know. I just kind of flick it. And, you know, I just uh, I, I turn in a little faster and release a little, at least a little faster. And then I just go. <laughs> and then, you know, someone like me, I, I try to view and, and think about the vehicle vehicle dynamics but um it really the setup stuff it, it seems more and more apparent to me that it doesn't matter unless you're like at 99 percent of the limit in in a way yeah you can still have like some setups that are just very hard to drive because they make the car too oversteer or understeer uh but it's it's also uh the car only does what you are doing to it and that's what also makes it difficult because one guy might be driving it in such a different way, especially when you're a few seconds off, that he might experience understeer because he always applies way too much steering lock uh, before there's any weight on the front, for example. So he just gets understeer and he would call the setup understeery, but then he gives it to another guy who is also a couple seconds off the pace. He might be way more gentle on corner entry and the front's grip better. And he gets oversteer with the same setup. So it's it's also very subjective, uh, very personal. Mm -hmm. I think that, I guess, is sort of the sort of the magic of the business and it'll never be perfect, you know? Yeah, and these aliens you talked about, they're just so good at, at being right at the limit with just a few laps. So they will right. be able to make a couple of changes and actually not just uh, placebo themselves into thinking this is better or isn't better, they'd be so consistent that they will actually see on average, this is two tenths quicker for me. And that's just, yeah, that's what they have. And well, I don't really have that. And uh, not, not that many people do, but that's one way. And then you don't really have to understand the, the physics or the vehicle dynamics, but
But for me, the field guard dynamics is what I kind of understand. So that's what I use to try and go a bit less slowly. And these guys just, they mm-hmm. do, you see it of the pants, feel of the, just in, in the moment, they, they somehow feel it and, and accomplish more probably than I will ever do. Yeah. And that was, that was never more apparent than when I was talking to uh, Raphael. Um, I can't, can't remember. Mc, McKelly, I'm going to totally butcher it but uh yeah i was trying to i was trying to like figure out he's done uh f2 and and uh things like that and i was trying to figure out how how he likes to go faster and he's like i don't know you just feel it you know he's like you can't explain it you just do it and i suppose that's the uh the fun game that engineers get to play with drivers <laughs> but yeah yeah it did it, it uh I guess that's why that's why we do it because you know you try to there's no there's no uh, perfect e- equation and and it's really consistency though like you say I mean I I found out that I'm I'm better at uh, you know working in the shop than I am in the sim and so I I just really do it for fun not competitive um, and because like for me in order to if I you know get into a session in order for me to be consistent you know say uh, you know one to three tenths per lap. Um, it might take me an hour or two just to get to having, you know, being in uh, in a consistent enough where I can be within a couple of tenths per lap. Yeah, it's it's hard. So it's hard work. Yeah. But do you uh, play o- drive mostly ovals or, or road tra- tracks? What's uh, your what's your uh, favorite stuff? I've always just been into GT3. Yeah, that's what I always enjoy. That's what I've only ever done really in the sim, at least. So yeah. Well, they are at some in some ways quite tricky as well in iRacing. There's a way to drive in iRacing. Going back to the the tire model, that's it's a subjective area uh, tires because it's very hard to figure out how they work and what they should or shouldn't do. But in iRacing, it's always quite difficult, and perhaps it's a little better now with the new tire model once they roll it out. But you have to be really careful about oversteer, and uh, that's something that's makes that makes it quite difficult and. The guys who are consistently quick in iRacing, I mean, I'm, if I try, I always spin out. But then in RF2 or in Automobilista, the cars are more forgiving. So you'll be slow if you overdrive it, but you won't crash as often. So it's even harder for me and uh, to be consistent in iRacing than it is in some of the other uh, sims. So definitely not easy to be consistent and up there in uh, in iRacing, yeah. Yeah, and that's what I'm uh, close with uh, Wyatt Gooden. And he's he's done a fair amount of uh real racing and then he also does coaching now um on track for people and then he's pro ranked in i racing and he kind of says the same thing where you know being fast in uh in i racing especially like in gt3 it's totally different and you even look at the setup differently he says it's not it's not exactly one to one versus in the real world mm, yeah so yeah it's always kind of interesting but but uh but yeah um now that we're kind of getting to the bottom of the show, um, what kind of uh, what kind of future, I guess, do you see for your business and for for Hoisenfeld? What kind of goals and objectives do you guys have, and and uh, you know where would you like to be in in a couple of years? Ah, well, uh, I'll answer it if you if you promise me to answer it for your uh, business as well, because I've seen your video of how you do everything. I'm really curious how you feel about this, but when it's uh, about us, uh, we've seen. The growth, and honestly, I would like it to sort of start stabilizing a little bit because growth is also very time-consuming and expensive and and uh, stressful at times. We've just uh, uh, bought another uh, place, like the, the neighboring place, so we have more area, uh, can hire more people. So I hope it will continue to at least grow a little, but I also wouldn't mind if it if it stabilizes in the next few years. Mm-hmm. Um, we like to do this because we all like sim racing and that has to always be the main thing so whatever happens we always have to decide will we enjoy doing this Uh, if there is an opportunity somewhere it might be seemingly lucrative but it also has risks or involves investors or something we probably always say no we just want to do it our way even if that means uh, shrinking in size eventually The, the fun has to be the main driving driving force and if the market goes where it seems to be going now, I just hope we uh, can continue like uh, renewing the products every now and then and adding some new products. And, you know, it's very easy to, uh, when we sit down and have a chat, 
with a beer to come up with at least 25 years worth of ideas so <laughs> let's just hope uh, we'll be still uh, around and have having fun and uh, making uh, sim racing products in, in 25 years yeah yeah i i completely agree um you know my case is it is a little different because i like my business is also i mean i'm, I'm just a one-man shop and so i i do totally agree where i would say in the last three years i mean i i've gone through uh from working full time to just doing it on the side to now, uh, back in April, I had, I had a really big month and I just decided to go all in and I quit my job and I figured, Hey, I'm going to do it. Um, I do have some loans. And so I'd like to, I'd like to even like what you said, if in 2020 I did the exact same amount of business, but I stabilized and I got my systems more efficient. Um, and I was able to maybe even keep, you know, a little bit of a stock, I would be extremely happy and uh and and so because i mean it is it's still it's still a huge risk for me and so i'd like to in the next couple of years um just be able to start putting money away versus having to plow everything back and then uh and you know because when the downturn does come and it always will we can we can be prepared and and the systems will be there um and financially i'll be able to you know weather it and we can keep doing what we love to do that's really the goal so yeah that sounds like uh, an excellent uh, excellent way to do it you do everything yourself though at the moment like almost uh, all the work with your cnc and, and stuff like that are you sort of thinking of is it like is that the enjoyment as well or uh, is there another reason that you don't order things more from like a laser cut companies or things like that you, you do something i feel i think but a lot of the stuff like the molds and stuff you do all yourself is it something Mm -hmm. because you love it or uh because currently you don't have the means to expand there for example you know it was a bit of a combination um i kind of chose to go the way i went um really to keep the cost as low as possible while being able to make iterations and changes as fast as possible and so i wanted to have um sort of a minimum viable product what's the minimum thing and the minimum amount of money that I can spend to get it to market. And then if the market proves to me that uh, it's there and there's demand, then I can maybe work on investing more into doing things in larger batches or uh, getting better tooling and, and things like that and uh, outsourcing a bit more. I'd like to, I'd like to be able to have all of my components um, done out of house and then, you know, do the assembly uh, and all the quality control in-house, I think that's definitely the direction I'd like to go. And that's kind of like, you know, what you're doing now, it seems. And so, um, but yeah, because that was just the biggest thing for me is uh, really being able to fail really fast and really cheap. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's good to hear that you're open to that idea because if you're a one-man uh, company, there's only so many hours in a week. And I think I heard you talk about like 80-hour weeks and uh, I think you're a bit younger than me, uh, some mid twenties, I would <laughs> guess, or something. What What are you? Uh, what What about? Yeah. So yeah, twenty seven. Yeah. So you you still have? Uh, yeah. Well, don't join the twenty seven club. Will be my advice. I mean, <laughs> I'm close. <laughs> so that, it, there's nothing wrong with putting in a lot of hours, uh, but it's you know you have a dog. I saw in uh, in the videos. Mm -hmm. It it will be ideal if if somehow you can. Uh, I don't know your your margins and stuff, of course, but indeed if you can sort of get the loans out of the way and slowly get to the point where you can just order batches and perhaps get as many wheels done with the same quality in in less time but i, I feel that's what you're aiming for as well and then it becomes more of a sustainable business because believe me well i can't speak for you but in 13 years i don't think you want to work 80 hour weeks anymore right exactly yeah that, and i mean even for example um, in this last two weeks, I had my CNC, CNC machine go down. And so I decided to make upgrades to it. Well, those upgrades didn't work. And now I have stuff that's behind schedule. And then, uh, also on top of that, I'm trying to, you know, design and, um, design new products, but then I'm also working on having to design and make all the tooling in house and, and it does get to be too much. And so 
I kind of told myself I'm going to do it. I'm going to, I'm going to give it the beans for a year or two, but then hopefully I can, you know, really like, like yourself, scale it down to maybe 40 hours a week. That's the goal. So that's the dream. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if the market is different there in, in the U S than it is in Europe because, uh, the things like laser cutting and, and, uh, for, for plastics and also for, for steel. There's quite a few places here that do it and they're quite happy to do relatively small batches. And mm -hmm. pretty soon it's not even that expensive anymore. And I, it sort of seems to be almost like the American mentality, which is great in a way to do everything yourself. Uh, Chris Smith, uh, a pedal competitor, I think he's going to stop his business. I think he also does everything himself from his shop, but it also puts a limit on how much you can do. But it almost mm -hmm. seems like sort of the uh, like the American chopper way that they all have the machines and every, everything is done in-house. And it's sort of an interesting almost, I don't know if it's like a, 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 almost a cultural difference or that if you want to get stuff CNC'd in the US, it's just more expensive than here even in, in the Netherlands. But it's interesting to see that a lot of the guys who I see doing wheels and do stuff in the US sort of pride themselves and, and rightly so to do everything themselves. Yeah, yeah, it's, that's, a, that's an interesting observation. And, you know, I don't even, I guess my thought process wasn't necessarily that I want all of my materials to be US materials and I want to do everything in-house and, and, and that kind of stuff. It was, I really looked at it just from the perspective of, um, it's going to be, you know, cheaper at least to start to do it in house. And then, yeah. you know, cause I've gotten, I've gotten a lot of quotes, like for tooling, like a mold, um, to, for them to design and machine a mold, it was like $5,000. And, and so it's like, I just, I was like, I can't afford that. There's no way. And so I was like, well, I'm going to figure out how to do it on my own. Um, you know, and I guess as the business grows, I do definitely want to outsource more. And so um, but then do the assembly and the quality control in house. I, I, I think that would be the way to go. So, yeah, well, it's an excellent. I think an excellent way. What, what, who is talking? Just a random guy who managed to sell some pedals. But it sounds like a good way. Plus, you have the experience, and that's something that nobody can take away from you. That you know how to do all this stuff by hand. That's some, you know, I wouldn't be any good if if I had to operate a machine. These pedals would never have sold. But you have that skill, uh, <laughs> that skill as well. So uh, I think, uh, you know, you, you deserve a lot of credit for uh, doing it like you do and being open with it in, in videos and stuff. So that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah. I really just kind of my philosophy as well. I, I didn't want to have an investor and I didn't want to, you know, lose equity in something I didn't even own. And, uh, and I've had less working years than, you know, someone like yourself. So I just didn't have as much capital to to put down. So I've kind of had to grow organically. And so that's kind of been my, uh, my experience and my, my story, but, but, uh, yeah, I appreciate you coming on. Yeah. You're welcome. It was, uh, was enjoyable. Yeah. yeah All, you bet. Always so good. Then, uh, so then where can people find you? It's huizingfield.com. Of course. Um, I will make sure to link that in the description for those of us that have trouble spelling that <laughs> yeah it's not the easiest name to pronounce for some reason yeah they, they didn't think of that when they chose the name what however many hundred years ago here in the netherlands they, they weren't really in internationally <laughs> minded uh then no i i can uh, i can relate though because my i'm actually half dutch and my, my mother she's 100 percent dutch All right. and her maiden name is van batavia <laughs> so it's a very it's a very dutch name <laughs> Right. Yeah, that's not that's not easy for most of the of the globe to pronounce. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll get a talk soon again. Yeah. See you later, Zach. Thank you.